Jurassic Park had cutting-edge visual effects, a great cast, the magic touch of Steven Spielberg, and a memorable soundtrack composed by none other than John Williams. Despite the film's success and continuing legacy, there's a fatal flaw behind the Jurassic Park franchise — the science. Jurassic Park doesn't really create dinosaurs so much as clone them. We're given the rundown as to how exactly this miracle of science came to be through a whimsical animated feature in the first film. Mr. DNA himself explains that blood contains DNA, and in order to make dinosaurs, John Hammond's expert squad of scientists had to find dinosaur blood. Fossilized mosquitoes in amber served as the source for the park's collection of dino DNA. Once the blood was collected from the mosquitoes, the DNA was sequenced, which is a monumental task. Geneticists sequenced the whole of the dinosaur's genome and patched in missing parts with DNA from frogs. With a complete code for a dinosaur-frog hybrid, Jurassic Park was then able to implant the chromosomes into an egg. Ta-da! You now have the makings of a baby dinosaur. Disregarding the mind-boggling amount of time it takes to sequence a genome, it seems like a fairly simple process, right? Not so fast. Author Michael Crichton left some canon-sized gaps in his otherwise very scientific explanation as to how Hammond resurrected the long-dead dinosaurs. Michael Crichton is famous for his fictional explorations of the furthest reaches of science. From resurrecting dinosaurs to artificial intelligence to time travel, his novels take a very serious, stringently researched approach to science fiction. Crichton leaves little up to interpretation and explains in excruciating detail the ins and outs of how the science in his book should, theoretically, work. All this theory is based on real, peer-reviewed scientific research. When Crichton was writing Jurassic Park, he firmly believed that genetic experimentation and manipulation was the technology of the future. Although not nearly as present in the films, the books show how various corporations are willing to do whatever it takes to make the next leap in genetic engineering. Ethics be damned. This is a theme continued in other novels such as Next, which questions whether or not a living person's cells can be licensed and then owned by a corporation. Crichton had his finger on the pulse of the latest in genetic engineering, and in some ways he was ahead of his time. What the well-paid, highly qualified folks at Jurassic Park are doing is de-extinction, taking an extinct organism and cloning it, giving it life in the here and now. New gene editing capabilities previously only seen in the movies are now available to genetic researchers, allowing them to explore the real possibilities of de-extinction. And no, that doesn't mean we'll see a real-life T-Rex anytime soon. But we might see something that looks incredibly close to a real live woolly mammoth. A Harvard team has been working on splicing mammoth genes into the DNA of an Asian elephant. The goal is to produce a hybrid mammothant, but there is no saying how long that process might take, or if it ever gets approved due to the ethical dilemma around resurrecting a long-dead species. The closest science has come to a real Jurassic Park scenario is the Lazarus Project, which successfully cloned embryos of the extinct gastric brooding frog in 2013. Those embryos died after just a few days, but it's considered an astounding success that they ever lived at all. The whole concept of reviving dinosaurs in Jurassic Park relies on the idea that the fictional scientists can easily extract DNA from mosquitoes fossilized in amber. This idea is unlikely at best, impossible at worst. The books mention that John Hammond has amber mines at his disposal, but even then, how many bugs laden with dino DNA are those miners likely to find? Not enough to supply a whole amusement park with a previously extinct menagerie. Even if Hammond stumbled upon the mother load of frozen mosquitoes, the DNA within them is not actually frozen in time. DNA, like all other organic material, decays. The reason why researchers think it's more likely that they could clone a mammoth is because their samples are only around 4,000 years old, rather than 66 million. The Jurassic Park method of extracting genetic material is unlikely to supply geneticists with much, if any, viable DNA to work with. The dinosaurs would be more frog than terrible lizard in the end. We're not gonna lie, we'd still buy a season pass to that park. Frogs are cool. Jurassic Park figured out how to create dinosaur chromosomes, but that's only half the battle. In 2013, scientists were able to get together the complete genome of an extinct frog, but that particular polywog isn't hopping around today. That's because even with all the genetic information, the chromosomes have to be implanted into an embryo. Project Lazarus's embryos died after a few days, never producing a viable fetus. So how did Jurassic Park do it? This is one of those details that Crichton was hoping we wouldn't look too closely at. Wait a minute, how, to, how do you interrupt the cellular mitosis? Can we see the unfertilized eggs? Oh. Once you have the chromosomes for a particular animal, you still need eggs. The books claim that parent company InGen had the tech to create artificial eggs with artificial yolks into which the dinosaur nucleus is injected. Okay, maybe this is another moment where Crichton is ahead of his time. The films, however, are way off base. They claim that they used unfertilized ostrich or emu eggs. Science shakes its knowledgeable head at that. A much closer relative would be required, despite the fact that emus are just about as intimidating as any velociraptor. Jurassic Park made hard-to-pronounce scientific names household words. Velociraptor, Gallimimus, Pterodactyl, and the titular term Jurassic. 
There is an interesting exclusion, however, of the word Cretaceous. The truth of the matter is that some of the most famous names in dinosaur history actually come from the Cretaceous period rather than the Jurassic period, which are separated by tens of millions of years. The Tyrannosaurus rex, Triceratops, and Velociraptor are all firm residents of the Cretaceous period rather than the Jurassic. Denizens of the Jurassic with famous bone structures were the Stegosaurus, Pterodactyl, and the T-Rex-esque Allosaurus. The Cretaceous was the final era of terrible lizards before the meteor turned their meat into ash. So why is the park known as Jurassic Park? Maybe Crichton just thought it sounded better than Cretaceous Park. It's definitely easier to spell. The revamped Jurassic World features the Cretaceous Cruise, where vacationers can kayak among the lazy-eyed Stegosaurus. While the films give a basic explanation as to why the park's all-female animals were suddenly able to reproduce, the books go into deep detail as to how a bunch of lady lizards were able to start producing young without the help of a male. This is yet another moment where Crichton was strangely ahead of his time. We find out in the books that, thanks to the frog DNA spliced into the dinosaur genes, they were able to change their sex and become male in order to mate. Reptiles having so-called virgin births is not unheard of, and these scaly single ladies don't even have to change their sex. An all-female species of whiptail lizard reproduces asexually. Parthenogenesis, the process of an unfertilized egg reaching maturity and ultimately hatching, has been observed in many reptile species, such as the dinosaur-like Komodo dragon, for instance. Raptors repopulating an abandoned theme park? Life uh, finds a way. Jurassic Park endorses that somewhat dodgy practice of gene splicing. The films make it sound easy to fill in the gaps where geneticists couldn't complete the DNA sequence. Jurassic Park chose frog DNA to better acclimate the eventual animals to the tropical climate of Isla Nublar. No one really wants to see a giant frog versus a scary, scary dinosaur. Jurassic World saw fit to mix it up and make some super scary hybrids to impress visitors. The Indominus Rex was made up of bits of Velociraptor, Cuttlefish, Pit Viper, Tree Frog, and a host of other dinosaurs. Today, in the real world, it is technically possible to make mutant hybrids. We do it with genetically modified food. But those anti-freezing and disease-fighting traits borrowed from other organisms aren't observable like big fangs or camouflage capabilities. Adding in the genes capable of expressing those features are one thing. Flipping enough genetic switches so that they are expressed is a wholly mysterious as yet undiscovered process. We wouldn't know how to make an Indominus Rex just yet, thank goodness. As it turns out, frogs are what make the whole Jurassic World go round. In the movies, it's the DNA of these familiar amphibians that has chosen to fill in the genetic gaps of the collected dinosaur genomes. Their traits are desirable for acclimating the newly resurrected animals to the tropical island of Isla Nublar, and it's the amphibian ability to change sex that led to the doom and destruction of Jurassic Park. In Jurassic World, it's again the frog's fault as to why everything got so bloody so fast. All the park's animals have a little bit of frog in them, but the Indominus Rex was a little more amphibian than others. Some tree frogs, namely the red-snouted tree frog, blend into their background so well that they are invisible in both visible and infrared light. This cloaking ability is how the Indominus Rex, super smart and ultra sneaky, is able to fool its captors into thinking that it had disappeared from its paddock. Imagine a raptor. Likely, the image summoned to mind is of the stunning practical effects from the first few Jurassic Park films, wherein the velociraptors were speedy, man-sized monsters that had thick scales and a pack mentality. This image is completely divorced from the reality of what paleontologists have unearthed about the species. Crichton may have been confused when writing about velociraptors. One of Crichton's favorite research books, Predatory Dinosaurs of the World, mislabeled the bigger, badder Dinonychus as a subspecies of velociraptor. Dinonychus's description better fits the creatures we see on the silver screen, whereas real velociraptors were small, flighty creatures no taller than around 3 feet. Recent paleontological finds suggest that they were covered in feathers, their arms like wings. Think big chicken rather than small dragon for an accurate image of a velociraptor. Easily one of the most famous fallacies popularized by the Jurassic Park films is the idea that Tyrannosaurus rex's vision is based on movement. That's a comforting idea if you're facing one of the big beasts, but there is little to no scientific evidence to back up this hypothesis. That maybe his visual acuity is based on movement like T-Rex, and he'll lose you if you don't move. Dr. Alan Grant chooses a, let's say, inopportune time to test this theory when faced with a T-Rex right after the park's power is cut, disregarding the fact that the animal can likely smell him and all his fear. The books take care to note that this wasn't Dr. Grant's theory, but instead another scientist. From what we know from real scientists, there's no credence whatsoever to the idea that T-Rex was anything other than a smart, sharp-eyed hunter, one whom modern researchers agree also had a great sense of smell and sound. Considering that these facts weren't discovered until over a decade after the Jurassic Park book and movie, we really can't blame the writers or filmmakers for exploring this theory. 
Forget everything you think you know about pack dynamics. Whether it's fluffy wolves or scaly raptors, popular media has been misled about how groups of deadly predators interact and work together. Older research that popularized the idea of an alpha of the pack has recently been proven inaccurate. In this flawed understanding, the alpha takes charge via displays of dominance and force. The strongest rules over the weakest, and if there's a younger, stronger contender, they can usurp the old alpha and take over. This is what happens in Jurassic World when the Indominus Rex effectively becomes the alpha of the raptor pack. However, more recent studies show that familial relationships take precedence over power. The alpha is whichever animal is the most like a parent to the rest of the pack. Thus, it would make more sense in the films that the raptor pack had stayed loyal to Owen Grady, who had raised them since birth and long established himself as the parent of the group. Since the raptors had imprinted on him, the pack's betrayal of him in favor of the Irex doesn't follow current understanding of pack behavior. Even with all the scientific errors and misinformation that the books and films spread, we have to give a lot of credit to the Jurassic Park franchise for making science cool. Paleontology and genetic engineering was put on a worldwide platform. The films not only introduced impressionable kids to an interesting career path, but they also opened the door to increased funding of the sciences. Following the release of the first film, paleontologists and archaeologists enjoyed what has been called the Jurassic Park phase, wherein enthusiasm for fossils and the pursuit of dino DNA was more ardent than ever. Whether you like them cuddly or cruel, ferocious or fluffy, there's no doubt dinosaurs have roared back from extinction. Around this time, great leaps and bounds were made in research into de-extinction, and discoveries that would have usually gone unnoticed by the popular press, like the sequencing of an ancient weevil's DNA, became sensational. However, the film's focus on de-extinction has also been implicated as a distraction. Why should we try to revive dead animals when there are living ones in need of protection? Regardless as to whether Jurassic Park's legacy has been a help or a hindrance to the scientific community, its influence is undeniable. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies and TV shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.